Hello. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today and to speak to you about something close to me personally that is about machines. Welcome to episode four of the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. In this podcast, we're sharing a series of audio explorations by artists of all disciplines into the ghost in the machine. I'm Legacy Russell. And I'm Victoria Sin. This episode's ghost and machine are Hito Sterl and Zadie Cha. This year, filmmaker and writer Hito Sterl became the first female artist named by Art Review Power 100 as the most influential person of the year. Part of Vito's talk reminded me of James Bridal from our last episode. Both of them speak about automation and agency. In Hito's case, automation being a lack of agency. How do you relate to this piece, Victoria? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting to draw comparisons between uh, Hito's piece and James Bridal's piece, critiquing this thought about um, automation or technological advances as an opportunity to become kind of like absent and our need to be very present in a technologically advanced society as it kind of like races on. Mm -hmm. I also related it to Timothy Morton's talk because Hito talks about this idea of bubble vision as kind of these spaces like virtual reality where, you know, we're kind of absent within the world. Timothy talks about our need to kind of include ourselves in the biosphere that we're present in, but not to, you know, to include ourselves as part of a network and not as as a species that has any kind of dominion over the rest of this kind of bubble, this biosphere that we're present in, you know, to to not create a distance and, and to be present where we are. This is Hito Sterl with Bubble Vision. So actually, I'm not going to talk about AI straight away, but I'm going to take some sort of detour because I usually work with visuals. So I'm going to start off talking about something which seems slightly different uh, on first glance, namely what I call bubble vision. What is bubble vision? It's about immersive technologies like VR and 360 degree videos, which are kind of spherical. And they are built on a sort of very strange paradox, which is also very well known. Because the viewer is at the center of a sphere, yet at the same time, he or she are actually missing from it. They are fully immersed into something they are not part of, not only your head is invisible inside these spheres, but also your hands <coughs> and also your feet. So this kind of vision is actually shaped by round things, by orbs, by spheres, by rounded lenses. One could call this paradigm bubble vision. In the last decade, 300-degree panoramas become became common in photography, in video and VR. And in parallel, there were also, of course, lots of discussions about so-called filter bubbles on social, social media that have been said to nurture division by creating parallel information universes, even though those statements are contested. It can hardly be contested, though, that bubbles have been an emblem of neoliberal globalization. (laughs) So-called bubble economies have shaped cycle after cycle of boom and bust, affecting real estate, finance, debt, bondage, as well as the art market of the 21st century. I think that this period is most likely over But it would be completely wrong to read this as the disappearance of the bubble paradigm. Instead, if any bubble burst at all, it didn't just vanish, it just multiplied into a multitude of smaller, steely bubbles. In art history, bubbles were already very popular in the 16th and 17th century. There was a whole genre by Dutch artists called Vanitas that painted glass and soap bubbles. And Vanitas loosely means the meaningless of earthly life, the transient 
nature of vanity and mortality in general. But this genre coincides politically with a period of political strife and religious division. It coincides with hunger and an 80-year war of independence. And at the same time, the emerging world market also fuels the art market. And more and more luxury properties find their way into the paintings, including colonial servants. It's also interesting that this time is the period of what is known as the so-called Little Ice Age. It was very cold. And that's not really a coincidence, it seems. In 2015, a fascinating text was published in Nature. Um, the authors, Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin, argue that the biggest dip in carbon dioxide over the past 2,000 years actually occurred during this period, and it was man-made. It happened around 1610, and they call their theory the orb hypothesis, orb for world. Uh, what is the reason for this dip in carbon dioxide? Actually, it's the presumed death of about 49 million of the original inhabitants of the Americas that were killed directly or indirectly through colonization. And as a result, the wood and the grasslands in the areas where they lived grew back and um, the, 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 the woods and the plants trapped carbon dioxide. So as a result, global CO2 levels and also temperatures dropped quite substantially. And they suggest to define this dip as the beginning of what, they, of what is called the so-called Anthropocene. What is the Anthropocene? This is the geological era in which humans significantly shape nature. In this era, man is supposed to be at the center of nature just as the viewer is at the center of a 300 degree panoramic sphere. But in the Anthropocene, the human at the center may actually be missing. Just like, as I said, in bubble vision, in 360 degree technology, the traditional off screen is mostly exchanged for a blind spot in the center, which means that you yourself are missing from the scene, even though you are at the center, even your hands are mostly transparent. But looking into orbs <laughs> also has a different dimension. Uh, crystal balls, they are called little orbs, or buculum. They are used to tell the future. They are magic prediction tools. And of course, they, as such, they also appear in the Harry Potter series, but uh, in this series, crystal ball gazing is one of the most unreliable magic arts. In fact, you can't predict anything using crystal balls except perhaps a foggy evening. But in the real world, uh, people are way more confident about crystal balls. Um, one of the most important contemporary data analysis startups is called Palantir, after some crystal balls or so-called seeing stones in uh, Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings. And Palantir, the company, specializes in financial and security-based data analysis. A Guardian report claims that Palantir can predict the future seconds or years before it happens. I would really like to know how the journalist <laughs> has established to confirm this hypothesis. Today's crystal balls stand in for data-based prediction. Predictive analysis means to manage risk and, if possible, to preempt it. This is still from the VR version of the famous franchise Ghost in the Shell. And this, this series of animes and films predicts this kind of preemptive strategy. In one of its many iterations, the main character is called Major, and she is an anti-terror police cyborg. But it turns out that she used to be a human. And actually, it was her as a human who got preemptively killed and disappeared as an anti-corporate 
terrorist, and then she was turned into a cyborg. In Ghost in the Shell, the ghosts of the Anthropocene, its missing and disappeared, end up as rogue AIs and cyborgs. In other words, to be eliminated means to be automated. And conversely, to be automated means to be eliminated. In reality, of course, machines are not literally the ghosts of disappeared people, but maybe they prove that something else is disappearing, namely the idea of the Anthropocene. Wait a minute, you will say, you introduced this geological era like five minutes ago, and you're saying it's over already? <laughs> you just said humans were all powerful, so can't we just enjoy it for a little more? But I'm serious, the minute humans become aware that they are supposedly all powerful and at the center of the universe, they are already busy handing over this power to opaque automated procedures, to black box algorithms, all sorts of crystal ball gazing and also, as Hans Ulrich said, to artificial stupidities. They are pushing it onto systems which are just as invisible as the famous invisible hand and, as everyone knows, today's main real existing artificial intelligence is the invisible hand of the markets, which supposedly knows and fixes everything. Is bubble vision, is it thus a training scheme to adapt humans to a world from which they are increasingly missing because they are being replaced by invisible systems. Are you already rehearsing how to be your own ghost? Look at your hand. Is it slowly turning transparent? Actually, I think one needs to accept that we are in a situation where Magic seems like a logical consequence because nothing else seems to work anyway. <laughs> so I think that we should look at these crystal balls again and take them seriously because there are real things to be seen in there. And let me name three. Firstly, what did Ron Weasley see when he took the crystal ball gazing test at Hogwarts? In the Harry Potter series, he peered into the crystal ball and he started describing at length an ugly man with a wart that was reflecting in the sphere. And of course, it turned out to be his teacher. But I think this means that one can say that every crystal ball reflects the likeness of its teacher or whatever trained it, so to speak. In this case, one could say, um, the bias of the whole of society. And secondly, there is another category of people you can, could end up seeing in crystal balls, and actually this is yourself, but nothing but yourself. Isolation is another well-known aspect of these VR and 360-degree video spheres. They cannot be shared with other people easily. They construct a specific, singular, customized, personalized point of view, which means that your selfie or your data selfie is reflected on the surface, even though you yourself might not even be there. In one word, you're not only missing, but you're also on your own. But there is also a third possibility of interpreting bubble vision. Let's assume magic works. And crystal ball gazing is actually a predictive technology. Let's assume bubble vision as such is a crystal ball. So there, we see very clearly that it predicts a future state in which you yourself are clearly missing. Whether you have been automated or eliminated or are in trouble because of another man-made carbon dioxide crisis. In the future, you will not be there. And if you understand it on this level, this urges you to preempt this situation. How to do this? I suggest using magic. 
It is no coincidence that the members of the Harry Potter universe are very skeptical towards crystal gazing because it seems mainly that the things one could see in crystal balls are distorted reflections of whatever exists anyway. And if you wear it around your head, you get isolated and made redundant, which, let's face it, is what automation is all about. But the solution is inside the problem, and actually Harry Potter's crystal ball teacher shows how to do it. And she is a lousy predictor. You know, she fails to predict anything during the whole series. But she comes up with an alternative use of crystal balls, which produces causal and even verifiable <laughs> results. And she does so during a decisive but battle in which the enemies of Hogwarts are attacking the school. And how does she use her crystal ball? She rides out on, on her broom and drops crystal balls on the enemies' heads. <laughs> How did, how did she do that? It's easy. She predicted gravity, not the future. In fact, maybe this is the whole lesson of bubble vision. Maybe one should start to predict anything but the future. Our next ghost is artist Zadie Cha. Zadie creates performance, video, painting, and textiles to interrogate overlapping cultures, notions of self, and her experience of the Asian diaspora. This is a conversation that I have with Zadie a lot, is this kind of use of fantasy and fabulation in both of our work to create these narratives that don't really exist in, in mainstream culture. You know, we, we need to be able to create narratives where we're at the center of our own experiences, rather than, you know, if you look at most Hollywood movies, if you ever see um, somebody who is Asian, or somebody who's a woman, or somebody who's non-binary or a queer, it's always as an other, as a character that's kind of, you know, stereotyped and, and one-dimensional. So, so we need to be able to fabulate narratives where we're at the center. In science fiction and fantasy, this can be a device to create narratives of an imagined better future. And it's not just about kind of escapism. I think when you immerse yourself in distant worlds, in different social contexts, you can use this distance to have like a better idea of, or a better perspective of, of the world that you are actually present in and the social context that you are actually present in. Right, so kind of imagination as a tool of activism, right, as maybe a tool of constructing a, a futurity. I do think it really ties into, like, you know, queer histories, of course, but also as well diasporic histories across the board, you know, looking at uh, narratives as well, in my case, of blackness and kind of thinking about how storytelling acts as a part of our history making. It allows us to kind of reconstruct not only our own identities and our past, but also as well kind of create our own records for mm. a future, right, which which is something that is incredibly important um, to be done for yeah. and by communities that have been historically marginalized. Definitely, definitely. It's something that is um, at the center of, you know, incredible, incredible movements like Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. which have been really inspirational to my work. You know, there is a need to create images and narratives that don't conform to these, like, overarching, actually very violent narratives that were taught from day one. We've got artists that, you know, kind of, like, I'm thinking of, you know, Tabitha Razar, E. Jane, for example, these are artists who are contemporary, who are producing artworks that deal with similar themes um, mm -hmm. and as well very much so kind of um, focus on this idea of fabulation, right? Figuring out ways yeah. to tell stories from different perspectives and in specific, um, in Tabitha's case, for example, um, from a non-Western perspective, like yeah, looking definitely. outward within that arc of Afrofuturism. Mm. And I think, you know, also fabulation is in Zadie's work and, and definitely in my work as well. It's kind of, you know, there's an idea that you have to be able to image the world that you're striving towards. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to be able to, to see something or, or know that it's there or possible in order to kind of work towards it. I got to talk to Zadie about this at the Guest Ghost Host Machine Marathon in October 2017. I'm really interested in Korean shamanism, um, which is a matriarchal um, ancestral indigenous religion. And basically there's um, 
the female shaman who channels in spirits of ancestral, let's say, um, family members or gods. And so I was interested in creating a space where my collaborator Jihei, who is a percussionist, kind of functions as a machine. So even though I'm the narrator within the performance, we're kind of one being, we're this machine that's summoning up ancestral spirits to kind of enter the space. And I guess it's a way for me within my fictional world to somehow feel closer to um, that part of my history. And a lot of times I reference, let's say, myself or my mom or my fictional grandma who's actually based on my mother's godmother. And also when you think about ancestral knowledge, I feel like from an artist's point of view, there's room for you to imagine stuff. You, there's room for you to fill in gaps and kind of make things up. And I think that actually the way I'm learning more about myself and my family and even my work is kind of making up stories and so I think fabulation is a way to kind of dress up tales and a way to kind of fill in the slots of what I think is missing and create something new that maybe I feel like is an emergence of what, you know, it is to be in the diaspora. Um, and so for me, you know, I started thinking, well, you know, my, my experience as an Asian woman, as a Korean woman is equally as valid, it's just different. It's worth mentioning that this was originally an audiovisual performance. Can you remember Zadie's costume? Yeah, I mean, Zadie's costumes are always incredible, and she creates new ones for every single performance that she does. They're very ritualistic, I think. Like, they are often kind of like robes, and they have a lot of patchwork, and there's a lot of symbolism. You know, Asian symbolism, the um, yin and yang, uh, monolid eyes as well. Yeah, always really beautiful and, and a very important aspect of the total work. It's neat to think that Zadie was actually, I believe, originally trained as a painter, right? And yeah. I, it's, you know, I, th I think the thing that's kind of amazing about her movement through different media and material is that she has always had this overlapping, uh, you know, layering, um, kind of montage making um, within every stage of her um, process, which is fantastic. And I definitely think relates to this idea of the diaspora that she speaks so beautifully about, you know, that really it is uh, much about kind of a, a patchwork. It's about bringing mm. many pieces together and also as well you know that the idea of diaspora is non-linear often it's yeah. something that um does have to or requires some fabulation but also some construction yeah, um it, it, together. exactly and that oftentimes in that movement right things are lost in that travel mm. um and as well like sometimes you know our tie to our root um, is something that can't always be identified, right? Because, yeah. you know, where people of, of color, where queer people have traveled through, mm. these bodies are bodies that have not always traveled through by choice, right? Um, so I do think it's always incredible with Sadie's work how she is, you know, able to imagine this futurity, but also very much so bring that history um, into plain sight and very much make it relevant to a wider audience, too. Yeah, definitely. I think like this kind of act of patching, constructing and self-mythologizing is almost mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like a, a survival tactic um, within kind of overarching um, cultural narratives which don't image you. And I think this thing of Zadie kind of like starting from painting and then creating these patchworks and then giving life to them through performance is almost, you know, it's like creating the narratives, creating the patchworks and then bringing them into reality and realizing them. Um, I think it's really incredible. This is Zadie Cha with Jihei Kim on percussion performing Perfumed Purple Rice and Sateen Songs for Zadie. My grandmother my mother's mother was a witch.
여보세요? 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 
The moon year had fallen, and my grandmother, she began to call. At first, her whispers were faint and distant, but soon came in loud and close. You me, you me, can you hear me? Her tone was serene, but her her tone was serene but commanded urgency. I nodded. I hear you. Go to the ravine behind the field of canola flowers. Find the cavern embedded in the rocks overlooking the yellow sea. Scale the jagged cliff side until you make it to the cave. And as you enter, look left. Follow the spiral staircase. And when you reach the top, turn right. There you will find a bronze plate. Strike it once. Rub your hands in supplication. Place four smooth gray stones with pink flecks into the circular craters of, of a volcanic rock. Lay down three conch shells and two young abalone at the base of an orange tree. Fill an iron bowl with wild rice and mung beans. And finally, leave a dried belt fish, one persimmon and two ginger roots in the center of the cave. Rub your hands in supplication. Strike the bronze plate. Stand still. I did as my grandmother instructed. But as I tried to complete the final task, a strange sensation came over my hands. I looked down and saw they had reddened. It felt as though I had sucked them into a pot of hot chili. The burning was incredible. But this lasted only a few moments, and soon after, my hands cooled, and I was lulled into a harmonic trance as the familiar ringing of multiple stone pellets rattled inside the hollow form of hundreds of bulbous brass bells. The metallic reverb throbbed against my temple. My heart raced, and the blood flowed fiercely down from my head to my stomach. Green liquid splashed in the back of my throat. I felt my lungs struggle for air. And through the chaos, I heard my grandmother's voice praising my efforts, thus instructing me further. Go back to the middle of the cave and dig a hole beneath the dried fish, persimmon, and ginger. I knelt down and began climbing back with the clumps of earth and soft stone, willing myself into the moist clay below. As I dug deeper, the frenetic chattering of the bells intensified. I continued to rip violently into the ground. Small rocks, grass, and chunks of dirt became embedded under my nails. My fingers, they drew no blood. My hands felt no pain. I continued to dig until finally I reached what appeared to be a small black box. Its surface decorated with ornate mother of pearl inlay. And brushing aside the earth in which it was encased, I eagerly pulled the box up and out from the ground, hurrying to pry it open. I fumbled with the silver clasp, a tiny piece of metal that kept this box closed for so long was finally about to open. Inside the box was an object bundled in colored sateen and silks. I recognized the craftsmanship of the textiles as Halmini. I knew that they belonged to her. As I gently unbound the soft fabrics that protected the object within, I was greeted with the sweetest smell of purple rice. And as I removed the final layer of sateen, the hidden object revealed itself. An old rotary dial telephone, and tucked beneath the handset lay a folded piece of paper. It read, Area code 001255 777 
Call me. Call me. The percussion in the piece, Jihai Kim's um, work is really incredible. And that, you know, at the end of it, she really kind of like goes for it um, on the drums. And I thought that was like such a powerful Absolutely. Moment. Also, Zadie's a big fan of hip hop, um, which is always something that I enjoy in terms of mm-hmm. how she layers her language. Just because, you know, the playing with the sound, there's such a contemporary feel to that, that we can obviously identify in sort of popular music and in pop culture. And, you know, of course, like in the conversation about the diaspora, that layering too becomes relevant. Um, so it's like it, there's so much in there that to kind of, um, you know, that's bound up within that to yeah. unwrap. Um, yeah. Which is great. It's the the ghost and the rapper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the end of episode four of the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. Catch up on the whole series at radio.serpentinegalleries.org or on Apple Podcasts. All of the material in this series was originally recorded at or produced for the Serpentine's Guest, Ghost, host Machine Marathon in October 2017. Our music is by marathon performer Fatima Al-Qadiri, a.k.a. I Shy. Impossible ideology! Guest Ghost Host Machine